Hi everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar. My name is uh, Guillaume Le Duc uh, from ADIMA, the Alliance for International Medical Action. And before our host uh, takes over, I'd just like to take a minute to thank uh, all the panelists, our host and uh, ADIMA USA uh, for organizing this. I also just want to say a quick word about ADIMA for context. As you may know, ADIMA is an international medical organization created in 2009. Our HQ is in, in Dakar, Senegal, and our goal is to provide quality medical care to patients in high mortality zones. And our ambition is to transform humanitarian medicines through innovation and inclusive governance. So we currently operate in 12 countries. We treat about 1.5 million patients a year and operate about 20 research projects on topics such as malnutrition, Ebola, or Lassa. So we're very excited about this panel. And as you'll see, we'll have very distinguished guests and uh, just so you know, we are as a, as a humanitarian organization at the very early stage on our work on climate change and we're here to share our ambitions but also our question and our challenges. So allow me to introduce our host, Dr. Sherry Weiser. Uh, she's a professor of medicine and internist at the Division of HIV, Infectious Disease and Global Medicine at the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital at USCSF. Her research focuses on the impact of food insecurity and other social structural factors on treatment outcomes for HIV and other chronic diseases, both domestically and internationally. She also studies how extreme weather events affect food security and infectious disease outcome and evaluates sustainable food insecurity and livelihood intervention as a way to improve health. She has published over 180 manuscripts on these topics and has been the principal investigator on over 25 grants in the area, including nine NIH grants. And in addition to the above, Dr. Weiser co-founded and will be co-directing the new University of California Center on Climate Change, Health and Equity, where she aims to expand climate and health research, education and clinical initiatives. So we're very excited. And Dr. Sherry Weiser, over to you, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Guillaume, and a warm welcome to everyone. And before I introduce our uh, distinguished panelists, I just wanted to thank our partners for their support and for bringing together what I think is, uh, is going to be a fantastic panel. And these include the Alima USA Board and also the Board Plus, which is the Alima USA Associate Board of Young Professionals, our, our University of California Center on Climate, Health, and Equity, and the UCLA um, De David Geffen School of Medicine's Global Health Program. And now I'm thrilled to introduce our panelists. So Dr. Greg Greeno is an emergency physician and spatial epidemiologist who studies public health in conflict and disaster affected populations. He worked in relief operations in the Balkans, Central America, the US and Haiti. He has researched many topics. So to name just a few, these include nutrition and food security in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, re refugee health systems in Colombia, Tanzania, Kenya, and Thailand, human security and landmines in Angola and Lebanon, and climate and crisis modeling in Somaliland. He currently focuses on spatial analysis and remote sensing applications to health outcomes of population in crisis, and he co-directs the humanitarian geoanalytics research and education program at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, and he's also faculty at Harvard Medical School. Guillaume Leduc is one of the co-founders of Alima. He's currently the development director based in Paris and part of the Alima team working on environmental issues. He has more than 10 years of operational experience with Alima, as well as Médecins Sans Frontières, also known as Doctors Without Borders or MSF. And he's worked in various countries, including Niger, DRC, Haiti, and Guatemala. He holds a master's in management from ESPC Paris Business School and a dual master's in international affairs from Sciences Po and Columbia University. Dr. Jean-Paul Mouchenboula currently leads Alima's program in Nigeria and is also part of the Alima team working on environmental issues. Before joining Alima, he worked for five years in the DRC Ministry of Health and four years in the Medical Coordination Unit of MSF. Since joining Alima, he has held the positions of medical referent, project coordinator, medical coordinator, and head of mission in countries such as Mali, the Central African Republic, and Nigeria. 
And last but not least is Bruno Yocum, who's the founder and director at the Climate Action Accelerator. He previously served as the general director of Medsense Sans Frontières Switzerland and the director of operation for MSF's operational center in Geneva, where he oversaw programs in 21 countries. He's worked in medical humanitarian relief since 1993 in a variety of settings, including Sudan, Somalia, Rwanda, and the DRC. He was also head of mission for MSF's programs in Iran and West Afghanistan. In 2003, he served as program manager for Somalia, Sudan, Myanmar, and Central America, steering the strategic planning and support for medical projects in conflict areas and in regions affected by epidemics such as HIV, TB, and sleeping sickness. So as you can see, uh, the, operation, the uh, expertise of our panel is quite impressive, spanning many different topics and areas uh, in, uh, in this uh, subject. So before I begin, I encourage all viewers to ask questions through the Q&A tool, which you can see at the bottom of your screen. And we're gonna be discussing some of these later in the center. So now turning to our panelists, and Greg, I'm gonna start with you. Your research at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative focuses on geospatial applications of climate science and health. Could you give us an example for those less familiar with that kind of work and walk us through what your research is on population health and migration? Thanks, Dr. Weiser, and thanks for the opportunity. It's great to be on with this panel and, and uh, appreciation for the sponsors as well. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask Allison actually to share uh, the slides, if that's okay. Um, so I, I, I come somewhat as a, as a, um, as a cheerleader. <laughs> for spatial analytics. And uh, so really just to give you sort of a high, you know, thousand kilometer view of, of sort of where we are. And I coming at this from a, as a spatial epidemiologist, uh, but appreciating so much um, how much georeference data is now out uh, in the public domain um, for humanitarian researchers and humanitarian health people in particular, in particular around this issue of climate and migration. And uh, on the left side of the screen, obviously here, I just kind of laid out some of these um, these sort of larger domains where we have georeference data and of course climate science or earth science right is is is, is all really georeferenced right much of it is um, is is remote sensed data um, so satellite imagery and so on um, and I I do have a background in GIS and so I have very much come to appreciate how earth scientists are now really uh, making a contribution to our work as, as, as humanitarian epidemiologists. Um, everything happens in time and place, right? And so, you know, appreciating geography as a variable is really, really critical. And I think understanding earth science, particularly when we're talking about, you know, predictive modeling and how, you know, what we're seeing coming down with climate change in so many areas um, and how it will affect populations and particularly population movement. Obviously, many of us who are epidemiologists um, are, are familiar with population data. So this would be censuses, um, you know, in, 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 in countries that have fairly well developed censuses, um, decennial censuses, but also in the humanitarian world where, um, you know, UNHCR has, you know, in, in established camps, um, uh, registration data, right? So a lot, most of that now is georeferenced data. So very useful. Georeference meaning it has coordinates. We can put it on a map, uh, and we can look at the effect of geography on a population. Displacement data, obviously, and there's a picture there of some work we did in Idlib, Syria, for instance, um, where you see a change um, from 2017 to 2019 um, as 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 as, um, as attacks increased in the central city of Idlib. Um, the uh, by the way, the picture in the population uh, picture is is actually my home city of Boston, where we see um, changes in 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 uh, it's a dot density map for those of you who are not quite used to all the mapping uh, of of um, of uh, household by race in the city of Boston, and it's hard to sort of zoom in on that because I, this is a very busy slide, but but you'll see how. Uh, what I think is there's less segregation that has occurred in the 30 years from 1990 to 2020, I think it's 2020. Um, and then land use, okay, another large area of, of, of reference data domain, right? And the picture there actually is a work done by a colleague, Michael Hagenlocker, that shows the change in how refugees, uh, refugees who lived in, uh, in uh, Western Darfur, how over time land use had changed. And so you see not only a larger footprint 
of, of, of urbanized setting of refugees, but also how they were using the land um, for agriculture, um, water usage, um, and how the land changed over time. So obviously this is really important for thinking about natural resources and scarcity of natural resources. Um, and then sort of this other area, um, and conflict uh, is obviously one huge area. And I, um, I've used the data sets from ACLID. Many of you are familiar with ACLID. Um, out of the out of the universe, um, don't remember the university in, in England um, that hosts the ACLA data set, but it's uh, it's also geo referenced and coordinated so that you can actually look at conflict events that occur um, and it's pretty much in real time, but other events as well. So um, you know, particularly around uh, human rights abuses and uh, mass casualties and things like that, all of those can be uh, geo referenced, um, certainly for those who are uh, involved in humanitarian operations where it's sort of day to day and uh, particularly health systems, you know, events that take place and operations that take place, you can actually geocode them. Uh, and on the right side of your screen, uh, obviously, um, the tools that go into this. And um, uh, maybe you've heard of ArcGIS, maybe you've heard of QGIS. I mean, these are the, the, these are the um, uh, spatial analytic tools. Um, QGIS is, of course, open source. Um, these are somewhat labor intensive uh, software products when you're talking about doing spatial analytics, but they're very, very powerful tools to be able to take each of these variables, um, say population data, you know, demographics, climate, uh, perhaps conflict, land use, and so on, and be able to actually do like regression analyses to see the importance of space and geography and all these variables on migration and, and population health. So that's that of course, is, for many of you will recognize that's a regression equation there. And so we're always interested in that Y, right? The dependent variable, meaning you know, population health, which is often our population variable that we look at. Allison, I'll ask you to advance uh, one slide, please. Um, I want to give an example, a little bit of, uh, uh, to Dr. Weiser's request. Um, so this was a, a project, uh, look, it, this is not quite a Lima uh, territory, um, I, I tried to get as close as I could. This is actually a little farther east in Eastern Africa and along the Eastern Corridor, so that includes Yemen as well. This was population data from the International Organization for Migration. Um, and what we really wanted to look at was, and by the way, there's, there's not a lot out there yet in the literature around climate and how it affects migration, um, particularly in humanitarian settings, I would say that's true. Um, so this was IOM. IOM, of course, uh, keeps a, what's called a flow monitoring registry. This is their, their sort of daily migration rates um, from these different administrative areas that you can see here on the, on the map. Um, um, and what we wanted to do was to bring two climate factors into play. One was precipitation. Um, so this was um, uh, uh, mean um, uh, precipitation. Um, and that data set that we used actually comes out of the uh, USGS. Um, their, um, uh, the precipitation is uh, five by five kilometer pixels. So this is um, raster data of millimeters per month of, of average precipitation. Uh, and then we use temperature. Um, this is the mean monthly temperature uh, in a little larger pixels, 50 by 50 kilometer pixels. Um, and what we want to do is really see the impact of, of, of these two climate factors on migration in particular. Uh, and that graph just kind of shows you how we were thinking through this uh, when we were designing the methodology. And Allison, the last one, please. Many thanks for <laughs> advancing. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, so these are the examples of the spatial tools that we use. And uh, to, on the left side of your screen, you'll see uh, uh, statistics on spatial um, autocorrelation. In other words, how much does space influence, right? Um, we, we say that, you know, geography, uh, you know, things near affect, each, affect something more than things farther away. Okay, that's the Tobler's law of geography. And so, you know, using geography as a variable here is really, really critical. Um, and that, uh, that's a cluster analysis uh, to see how much space really affects things. So you'll see if you can kind of hone down a little bit there, you'll see in those sort of pink shaded areas um, in these administrative areas that, um, that, that geography actually plays a very critical role in migration. So um, that these are areas that are where geography is likely to, to, to influence migration. 
And then the blue areas are where that's not the case at all. So sort of varying degrees of how much space real or space spatial factors really influence people uh, close and near close and far away. Um, on the right, and this is where it gets, I think, kind of uh, interesting, is the actual uh, regression. We're going to ask you to yeah. just wrap up in about a minute. Yeah, sure. Okay. So this this on the right really shows how much temperature and and precipitation play a role in people actually migrating. And so um, this is uh, this in this different administrative areas. Um, the top maps show um, migration. Um, uh, how much um, uh, uh, temperatures influence migration um, over a three three year period of time, and how much um, in the bottom is how much um, um, precipitation influence migration. And it, it's kind of interesting because um, you know, particularly along the coast, um, where you've had high levels of precipitation and high degrees of migration. Um, when we went at went back and asked participant participants why, uh, a lot of it had to do with um, you know extreme weather events and natural hazards. So it really does help, I think, programmers think through in the future how they can predict and better target their resources um, uh, using these two two climate factors. Great. Well, this Thanks. is so interesting and very true that for standards or Demo large population-based surveys, it's very difficult to get at migration. So these methods um, are very, uh, very uh, apropos. So I'm gonna turn now to Jean-Paul. So Alima, you know, we know that Alima has been providing medical care in crisis settings in Sub-Saharan Africa since 2009. I'm wondering if you can talk about how you've seen climate change shape the lives and health of the communities you serve, and also how this has changed over time. Okay, thank you. I think that is a quite uh, difficult question and we are talking about uh, the way population are living, especially communities. But we can say that uh, the communities we are serving uh, in those uh, regions are more resilient and they have uh, developed some uh, coping mechanisms to, to, to face uh, this kind of situation. But I think that I will be, I will be more focused on how the climate, climate changes impact the need of population in the community we are serving. So um, basically we have uh, three uh, types of uh, impact. Uh, the first one is uh, those linked to the increased frequency and severity of extreme weather events and especially uh, the increase of uh, number of respiratory and cardiovascular diseases. Uh, for a practical example, I can say that in the northern part of Mali, uh, the cardiovascular, di cardiovascular diseases have become now the, first, the most common cause of mortality and morbidity. And a few decades ago, uh, it was uh, disease, infection disease disease. Uh, the second, uh, the type of uh, impact is those uh, linked to the change in prevalence and uh, geographical distribution of diseases. And um, uh, particularly uh, in the area we are working in, we can take example for, let's say, the peak of uh, the peak season of malaria is uh, coming now more earlier uh, due to the, some changes in the, the rainy season periods. And uh, the, let's take also an example for Ebola. As we say that Ebola used to be uh, an ep epidemic or outbreak situation in Congo and Central Africa in general. But a uh, few years back, we faced Ebola in, in Guinea. So we are still asking ourselves a lot of questions for that. And the last example I can uh, raise is the one um, related to Lassa fever in Nigeria. And uh, we know that one of the reasons is because of also the uh, deforestation and uh, also some changes in the environment. So some rodents are, are coming more often to the different houses. So they are also bringing these diseases. And uh, the last uh, group of uh, impact is those uh, linked to, to the social, let's say to the this, uh, this, um, population displacement and also some uh, violent conflict. So uh, some example in the area we are working is uh, basically in, um, in Burkina Faso in the Northern Mali and in Nigeria, uh, the former elder conflict. 
uh, when a firm uh, elder move from uh, uh, due to the drought, they move uh, with the earth to the different area. So there uh, is source of source of conflict between population. Thank you. Sorry, I was on mute. And just a brief uh, one question about the rise in cardiovascular disease. Is that linked with a concurrent rise in obesity as well, maybe related to food insecurity, or what is the um, main driver of that? Yes, uh, for sure, it's, uh, it's, it's not the climate change is not the only reason uh, raised to this uh, increased rate of cardiovascular disease. There is a couple of reasons. Uh, but especially, we say that is really very documented that climate change is one of them. We can also uh, say that uh, some uh, the way uh, those people are living, the way they are eating, they are eating so many so many fat foods is also one of the reasons. That is a couple of reasons. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So, Guillaume, what are some of the challenges in adding a climate lens to your medical humanitarian operations? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a big challenge. And, and as, as Jean-Paul was saying, you know, we're, we're seeing changes, but we're trying to understand what's happening. And a lot of those changes are, are come from different multifactorial reasons. So it's, it's what's the key challenge for us is to, to understand that. Uh, but if we could put a couple of slides also, and I'll go through the first few ones first. Um, so, you know, just, just, this is just a slide to show, you know, for us as humanitarian, we always look at the, at the scale, you know, and, and the crisis. So, you know, this is just to show that for me, my question as humanitarian is like, is this going to be the, the, the big crisis? So, and this is where we turn our attention, you know, when we're starting to see uh, massive, massive deaths is <laughs> coming through, you know, we don't want to miss the big one. Um, so, so this is why I think there's a, the, the, the first challenge for us as you might have done is, is change itself, you know, is, is, the climate is changing is, and so we as you might have done need to change too because this is going to be a cause of mortality. So before I think we could sort of turn a blind eye in a way saying this is not a, this is not a question for us, you know, we have to focus on movements of population, call it our breaks, but now we're starting to see that there's, there's a connection and this could be a source of, of massive crisis, massive population movement. So. So this is one of the, the first questions. And then if you, if you look at the, the second slide, please, I mean, uh, one of the, the key issue uh, is that the current state of the United States system is that we don't have a lot of capacity, you know. <laughs> uh, we actually are underperforming, you know. If you look at the first number, which is from the, the UN Secretary General report, you know, from the World United States Summit, you know, it's a very rough number, obviously, but, it says about 50% of humanitarian needs are not met. So, you know, it means that the current system is not designed to meet actual needs. So if we have an increase of needs, it means that we're definitely going to be very overwhelmed. So we should all be aware of that. Um, and if you look at the second number, you know, a few clinical trials are actually conducted, you know, in Africa, that's according to clinicaltrial.gov. So we're also not doing the research uh, that's going to help us uh, find problems to those medical issues. And the, the last thing is for capacity, and that's part of the ALIMA model, is that only 3% of funding is allocated to local actors. So this is a bit to show, you know, and the last slide is on, is on the ALIMA model itself. You know, we try to, 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 to be a, a non-governmental alliance. So our response is to bring in uh, research partners and local actors. So thank you for the for this slide. And these are the countries where we are operational. But on, on the challenges, you know, I think... For us, one of the key challenges is, is understanding better climate change. As I was saying, this is very early stage for us and, and the research that Dr. Vino presented is, is super interesting. Um, so this is the type of, uh, we need to find new tools and, and build new skills you know, to understand climate better. Dr. Jean-Paul was saying you know, from the field, we see changes, but we don't really know where it's coming from, right? Is this event in malnutrition really related to climate change or is there some other factors? So, we have to learn how to figure this out. Uh, we don't want to be overly simplistic and say, oh, this is climate change. We want to understand better. Are we seeing patterns in malnutrition? We're seeing some increases, but this is really linked to climate change or is it linked to economics or you've studied food insecurity, uh, Dr. Weiser, you know there's lots of causes to that. So right now I would say as an organization, we're not good at this. And I think as a, as a system, we're not. Good. And the, the last challenge for me is, is actually launching those projects. You know, we need to launch 
uh, projects that are dealing with this, both from a response point of view, you know, we need to respond. That's kind of easy, but also in terms of research, connecting, developing new partnerships that are going to bring different types of, of skills, you know. Um, so we hope we can, we can so solve that, but I think those are the, the three key challenges. Thank you. And uh, we're going to get delve into some of those challenges in the questions in a few moments. So Bruno, you recently founded the Climate Action Accelerator and would love if you can tell us about the organization and its mission, including how you're going to be collaborating with Olima. Yeah, so thank you very much um, for the invitation. Um, yeah, so a, a few words on, on the Climate Action Accelerator. It's a, it's a newly founded initiative um, um, based, in, based in Geneva and with already um, a number of organizations on board, including ICRC, Alima, Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, uh, and many other NGOs. And the starting point of this initiative is, uh, well, it's, you know, it's facing, um, well, the emergency situation that we're now all aware of. Um, you know, we, the world has taken about one degree warming in the last 150 years. We know more or less that there'll be another one degree of warming in the next 20 to 25 years. This translates in many regions of the world by, you know, two degrees on land, sometimes more. And uh, the whole point is, you know, in the face of reaching close to climate tipping points, is how can we contribute to, you know, social tipping points with the deployment of climate solutions at scale throughout society. And so the, the Climate Action Accelerator is, is all about trying to rein in the footprint of organizations and how, you know, how we can really help with the surge of responsible organizations acting on themselves, uh, but also um, you know, um, being champions within their ecosystems, trying to trigger a domino effect with others and participating to a, a community of practice, uh, sharing solutions as a kind of free, common, universal good to, to accelerate the process. Um, so what, what, what we're about, it's really supporting organizations to half their emissions directly by, uh, by 230. Uh, you know, along the lines of uh, the Paris Agreement, and this is would be done without compensation, so no real, you know, games on numbers, etc. We talk about absolute reduction. It's it's you know helping to turn organisations into into champions, and and you know trying to move out of uh, I would say um, a focusy to actually operationalize things and to look at concretely what can be done at the level of these uh, humanitarian organizations first, but also health and education. Um, so why, why humanitarians? I mean, what role do they have to play? Is, you know, they're, they're all, they're like, like health organizations, they're, they're institutions with you know, very large networks, they inspire trust, they have a, often a big reach and they can actually influence others. If I, if I take a movement like the, the Red Cross um, movement, it's one of the few human organizations with representatives and activities almost in every district of the world, uh, in contact with authorities, with suppliers, with communities. Um, and you know, they are, um, just like Alima uh, is, able to trigger social tipping points. Um, so, what, um, how have we started to, you know, to work with Alima is, Alima, it's, it's a great experience because, you know, we've agreed together to, to, to work as a, you know, a live laboratory, you know, looking at what can be done. So, we've, we've been uh, looking at the footprint of the organization, we've been looking at basically what, um, you know, concrete solutions can be evaluated, what their act, uh, impact can be, looking at trajectories of how to curb down emissions, you know, within the next three years, but also within the next decade, while actually uh, comforting the, the mission. And it's, uh, it's an extremely, um, it's, an, it's, an ex it's an extremely interesting laboratory, full of lessons for many other organizations. And, 
And now in the, in the um, I would say in the coming weeks, we're actually going to deploy a lot of these lessons with other organizations like the International Red Cross Committee, Médecins Sans Frontières and others. And we aim to have about 20 organizations on board uh, by the end of this year. And we, you know, what we'd love to do is to, to, to trigger a, a movement, a domino effect, whereby more and more organizations join this movement and not only aid, but increasingly also health institutions. So to actually to follow up on that, because um, you're talking about collaboration with other institutions, um, what are some of the tangible takeaways from your work that other humanitarian organizations can use to reduce their own climate impacts? Yeah, I think um, the, <clears throat> the key takeaways is that this is not about, you know, uh, dreaming of, you know, impossible action. It's uh, when you look at the footprint of, a, of an aid organization, actually the sources are very concentrated. Uh, if you, it's mainly about procurement of goods. It's about transport of both people and goods. It's about energy and buildings. And for almost each of these, uh, you know, sources, you have actually, um, you know, solutions and actions that are uh, identifiable and that can be turned into, you know, um, into uh, tangible results. And I think, you know, I think um, it's important for each organization to, to have a thorough understanding that they also participate like others to the, you know, the global situation of warming and they can, by their example, you know, make a difference. You know, if, if organizations on the front line of uh, human impacts everywhere in the world can show that they're able to carry out assistance while curbing their own footprint and you know, taking stock of what the science says, it's a very important message uh, to all the others. Yeah, agreed. And Guillaume, I would love to see if you could add something or to hear your perspective on this point from your work in Olima and MSF. Yeah, I mean, as I said, one of the key points also to, to work on our own reduction is first the decision, right, to, to, to face that. And I think Bruno's and the, the Climate Action Accelerator has been very instrumental in that because, as, as I said before, and if I take a very concrete example, you know, when I was running a project in DRC in North Kivu, you know, if there's not enough uh, fuel, you know, in the city, you know, that the way you would put the fuel is, is at the hospital, you know, to make the generator run. So... We will always argue. Well, we're allowed to we're allowed to burn uh, as humanitarians because we're doing you know we're, we're saving lives. But but that's not enough you know anymore. And and I think that that's that's why we need to set ourselves. And, and for a long time, myself I was like, well, I'm allowed to fly because I'm doing a humanitarian mission. You know, people on vacation should stop flying. I, I mean, you know, humanitarians should be allowed to fly. And I, I still think that's partly true, but it's just not enough anymore. And and so now people are starting to see that we need to be uh, more demanding, you know, and, and look at our own impact, not only in terms of emission, but generally environmental impact. You know, what about medical wastes of medical humanitarian organization? How is that managed? So there's lots of questions that we really need to, to build. Uh, obviously, this is a challenge because it needs to change our mindset. Uh, and then it's about, like Bruno said, building the right uh, uh, knowledge and understanding, you know, of, I mean, looking at our supply chain, obviously, is going to be a big uh, impact uh, for everyone. But then there's lots of things to learn, and then we can share within organization because some of the questions are being, you know, how much, you know, kilos of of, of uh, CO two are you emitting when you're transporting, you know, plumbing that to Chad? That's a question that not a lot of people looked at. But once we've looked at it, then we can share the info, you know, amongst ourselves and say, okay, this is fine. Okay, we have that data. Let's not every NGO needs to recalculate those things. So being able to share, we're gonna learn a lot from, from others. And the last thing is, I think it's gonna help us on adaptation to, you know, and, and this is maybe further away a little bit, but if we learn to be less dependent and to understand where our de uh, dependencies are, you know, we might be more uh, able to adapt and to design or uh, probably uh, humanitarian organization that can function differently if the system were to, to change very fast. That's a little, more of a challenge even. Yeah, and we have a lot of academics in the audience here, and we've noted that 
some of the practices pre-COVID that were not very uh, conducive to, not very positive for the environment are resuming. So it's a good time to remind uh, all the faculty as our medical students are working very hard to do at UCSF to reduce your faculty travel and to, to minimize that as much as possible. So we know that communities and populations that have contributed the least to greenhouse gas emissions are often the most negatively affected by climate change. And we know also, unfortunately, have little say in how these problems are addressed. And I wanna hear about how your organizations include community voices, both in your plans and in terms of how you set priorities. And Greg, I'm gonna start with you here. Oh, that's, a, that's a great question, uh, thanks. Um, you know, it's interesting because often when we look as to reason why people migrate, it's not really always just climate. And I think, you know, one of the things we tried to do with that particular project was to see how much, you know, like you would do in a regression analysis, because the back part of that was a lot had to do with socioeconomic factors, a lot had to do with other sort of seasonality. Um, so, and it wasn't just all about climate. So, so you're right. I mean, I think we can do a lot of quantitative work, but if we don't really get down and understand the qualitative reason and match that up, and like, you know, I, I'm a big believer in mixed methods research because it really does help us inform, you know, why, why, why we're seeing what we're seeing, right, uh, often. Um, so often the qualitative piece is, is, is very much explanatory to see what we're seeing. And I, you know, we, we went back uh, several times, for instance, with, uh, with IOM, looking at this and saying, well, you know, help us interpret what we're seeing. And, and really it's working with the local, the local NGOs, um, uh, folks that are, that are uh, we partner, we try to partner as much as we can with local organizations, um, many of whom are, are very much, you know, GIS um, uh, 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 focused <laughs> um, and, and, and very erudite on, on how to use this kind of data. And they know their environments better than we do, right? I mean, it, it comes right down to that. And so, um, you know, I think, you know, as we've been talking through these discussions, um, much of these issues are multidisciplinary. So it's bringing in local expertise, not just even health folks, but it's, it, it is, you know, policymakers who are looking at, you know, demography, land use, some of these other things that are really, really critical to, to influencing people's health. Um, you know, it just, it's, it's, it's something we've known for a long time in the humanitarian world. It's an old adage, but it's, but local really, local knowledge really makes it, makes a big difference. And particularly when we're talking about things like climate, which are, which can be very regional and very, very sort of large geographically, it, it does help us say, okay, how do we hone in? How do we get on a granular level to see what we're seeing? And, and, um, so yeah, I think, I think it's critical. I think all of us in these, you know, sort of particularly these academic disciplines, you know, we're trying to coordinate these all together, um, really have to have to have local partnerships uh, to, to really inform us. And to, and to inform our agendas from the- Yeah, agency. exactly, right. And obviously that, you know, and that's part of the, you know, it's, it's their policies that are, that are going to play here. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. So Jean-Paul, do you have any additional thoughts on this? Yes, sure. Uh, so from our side, Alima, I think that everything starts from our charter. The first point in our charter is about uh, putting the passion in first, uh, in the center of all our interventions. So we are making sure that as the patients are living in a community, so the community is being part on the process, on all the steps for our process. So since the, from the um, exploratory mission, we are discussing with the community, we are trying to understand better the problem they are facing, and we are trying to implement uh, the solution together. So uh, secondly, uh, from each, uh, let's say, health center, the hospital, they have some, uh, uh, let's say hospital development community or war development community. So it's a group of persons. This uh, most of them uh, usually they used to be volunteer. So we are we are training them to 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 better understand to analyze their problem, 
impacts and also to, to bring out to identify solution to face uh, those problems. So even if we are particularly working on in health, but the methodology, the approach we are using can be replicated for any other situation, especially uh, those uh, related to climate changes. So, and uh, finally, uh, we, as we are working, Alima is an alliance. So we are working in partnership with uh, uh, local uh, NGOs. And we know that local NGOs uh, have a better understanding of the problem in the communities. So we are trying also to put everything together so that we can raise the voice uh, in the community. Thank you. Great. And just as a, a brief follow-up, because there's uh, such a movement, um, as we, we all know, to decolonize global health. And does it feel like that is happening to the same extent in humanitarian organizations? And this just for any of you. I mean, it's never it's never fast enough, I think, and, and there's you know different perspective, you know, and for those of us who are not in the US, it's this is a uh, different approaches from different cultures but you know I think if you look at Alima I think it's an interesting example you know of shifting shifting power like like Jean-Paul was saying you know we're not just partnering with local NGO we are an alliance you know of, of local NGO international humanitarian workers and research institutions and when I said inclusive governance in my introduction I you know, local NGOs are represented at the highest level of governance. So they're at the board of directors level. So when we're talking to the president of a local NGO, for instance, in Niger, we're working with Befen, with Dr. Lamin Kole, he's the head, he's a surgeon. I'm not talking to an implementing partner. I'm talking to a board of director a level person, and he was the vice president of Alima for a long time. So this is one way I think that Alima is trying to contribute to this shift and if you look currently, you know, our president, who unfortunately could not join this panel, but is Dr. Richard Cojon, he's from, from DRC. Our, our CEO is Dr. Momoni Kinda from, from Burkina Faso. Our director of operation is Dr. Kader from Niger. So we have a very diverse uh, uh, team and, and very much centered, you know, as I said, in, around our headquarters that are based in Dakar, you know. So we try and reverse a little bit the proposition obviously it has to be diverse and there's lots of, of points but that's a contribution i hope to to yeah. those those questions anyway yeah and i think sheila was asking something very similar about um how um you know not only bringing in local expertise but putting them in charge and it sounds like you're doing some of that at alima but um she had also asked what is standing in the way of that where it's not happening I mean, maybe I take that as a follow-up, <laughs> sure. but, but yeah, I think there's lots of barriers, what we call barriers to entry, you know, in, in, in economics, you know, like if you want to set up a, a, a local NGO, uh, this is what we were seeing, you know, I had some, some colleagues, they were head of mission at Médecins Sans Frontières, so they were Nobel Peace Prize running a 20 million euro project with, you know, 2,000 staff in every coast, he's from Niger, and then when he comes back to Niger, and he's trying to set up his local NGO. People are like, ah, oh, you're a local NGO. Are you able to, you know, to to deliver on this project? Can you actually manage a million euro? And he was like, I was managing twenty million euro two weeks ago. So what happened? I have the wrong logo on my shirt, and that's really what happens. You know, there's discrimination, and I think we need to, to you know, to to see that there's lots of capacities. You know, I don't like to say that we're doing capacity building. You know, we're doing sh shifting. Shifting power, I think, is more interesting and, and giving the means. They will also, it won't, it won't be independence, you know, we'll need partnerships. That's why we want to do an alliance, you know. Local NGOs, they still need support, you know, they might be missing a doctor on an HR, they might be missing, you know, researchers. And by connecting all of this in the right way, I think that's where we have the best impact. Great. So, Jean Paul, can you talk about what the biggest opportunities are as well as the biggest challenges? for addressing health needs related to climate change in crisis settings. And Stella also asked for sort of more specifics of bringing in, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, what, uh, what uh, you know, interesting interventions related to climate change, you know, maybe some specific projects. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, for opportunities, uh, we can say that uh, generally the, 
people and community we are working in are, are, are more resilient. So it's a, a little bit simple to implement some um, effective response and especially uh, in a crazy situation. Uh, secondly, some community and uh, also governments have started, even if it's, uh, most of them are just in the first step, but they have already started a preparation for health needs brought, to, brought on by climate changes. So uh, we, as we know that most of them are uh, especially for those uh, linked to flood, flooding or uh, de movement displacement, so they they can be uh, in a, they can be happening in the short time. So that's a lead to most of the time to an emergency situation or a crisis situation. And also, Alima as an emergency organization, we have a huge experience in dealing with uh, this kind of situations. Uh, we, I can also add that uh, almost all of the, our institutional do donors are now clearly committed to either to prevent uh, from some negative impact of uh, climate change from happening and or to deal with uh, its consequences. So that uh, it's a little bit easy also for, new, for us to, to bring the, the situation to them so that they can also, uh, the situation can be addressed. So uh, finally, uh, even if we are just in the let's the health sector, but we know that in this kind of situation, uh, rapidly we have a multi-dimensional response. Even if the health sector, we are mostly we are the first one to intervene because maybe I can take an example if uh, maybe a flooding and after that we have a cholera outbreak. So it's a medical response, but. Uh, Quickly or rapidly, we'll see some people, some organization we came from, uh, most of them will be dealing with uh, wash, uh, shelter, and everything. So at the end, we'll have a kind of uh, multidimensional response. So uh, for challenges, um, well, we can say that uh, mostly um, those situations are uh, happening in, a, let's say, some places where people are not prepared to deal with. Uh, I previously mentioned the case of uh, Ebola in Guinea, where uh, it was just like this, uh, but uh, because Alima, we had a kind of experience because we have already dealt with this, that with this malady and uh, this disease before. So that's why we, we were able to respond to this uh, disease uh, in a short period of time and uh, in a proper manner. So uh, the second uh, um, challenge I can raise is that, um, uh, the health system in most of the, the area we are intervening, the health system is not functional or are not functional at all. So that's say that uh, these, uh, those situations, when they are happening in a situation or on top of, or let's say in the health system which is not functioning, so is a little bit, is bringing a little bit challenges uh, to implement and especially uh, if they don't have a kind of uh, close support by uh, an international organization or uh, who is working in, in the area. And uh, uh, I think that's, uh, yeah, I think yes, that's uh, yes, it's very helpful. So I'm going to turn um, for one more question and then Trish will end us off with a good question on the, on the next steps for research. Um, so, Bruno, we have many medical students and health professionals in the audience today. What are some steps they could take in their own practice and training to deal with the health effects of climate change in the communities that they serve? Yeah, so, so uh, you know, I, I think first of all, it's important to, to realize that, you know, health professionals and health institutions have a, have a big leverage on, on the situation. and. Uh, in, in, many, in many countries, in many towns, um, hospitals, university hospitals are among the biggest employers. Uh, they see you know, tens, hundreds of thousands of people going through their institutions uh, that are connected to, to families, to, to patients, to staff. And so it's, it's very important to consider that um, you, know, you have a leverage on the situation. And, and because um, you know you belong to a, a profession which is uh, often much more trusted uh, than others um, because of the representation of integrity of you know 
public service, etc. Um, um, there, there are roles, key roles that can be can, that can be taken. Uh, you know, I think it comes with it's high time health organizations and institutions and student leagues, uh, you know, professional federations take on publicly uh, targets of decarbonization uh, and actually, um, uh, you know, use the power uh, they have. I think it's important that they pass on also uh, these messages to the health you know, to the communities they're working with. You know, take something as simple as, uh, uh, you know, diets that are served in, in cafeterias, restaurants, and health institutions. Uh, if I take the hospital in Geneva, it's the biggest cafeteria in town. And, and the question is, you know, if hospitals themselves don't serve what we call, you know, planetary health diets, who will ever do it, you know? And, and um, if, if, uh, if professions that you know that represents care for people, uh, knowledge, science, um, don't take on themselves this role, uh, it will be very hard to convince other you know other businesses and and other uh, functions in society to act on the emergency at stake. So you yes. know, my message would be a message of you know encouragement and taking on responsibility. Yes. And, I, and I will say on that note, our, our students were the ones that worked towards banning meat in UCSF uh, cafeterias. So I'm gonna end with Trisha's question, which are what are the main next steps and research questions that's gonna bring the climate conversation forward in the humanitarian sector? And, and also that will benefit people more directly. And she asks, is it really about attribution of impacts to climate change? Or what are some of the key principles for a research strategy? And I'm going to start with you, Greg. And yeah, I will ask you to speak for about two to three minutes. <laughs> okay, I'm going to try to bring in one more person. Right. Thank you for, for, thank you for the question. Pointedly, I would say, um, you know, again, we're talking in, in multidisciplinary terms here. And I think, you know, my challenge has seen, you know, the, the world of the climate scientists, bringing the climate scientists together with the population scientists. Um, particularly with epidemiology, and be able to, to to sort of integrate our disciplines in a way that speak directly to to the issues of population health, health outcomes, and migration, and and um, so that that remains to be the challenge. I think you know uh, partnering, particularly with people in, a, in other disciplines, and I, like I said, I think you know uh, geospatial data kind of links us all together. Um, I think that's that's one way to do that. Um, but to your question, Trish, too what we do in terms of research has to have a direct policy or program impact. And that's really what public health is all about. And for those of you in medical schools who I think, you know, understanding population-based science is going to be really critical uh, to your career. And, and yeah, I think we have to you think about, you know, targeting, um, you know, population and, uh, sorry, um, policy and programming in a way that can make an impact um, for sure. Yeah. Right. And I'm going to turn to Guillaume to see if you have anything to add on that point about sort of next steps and really how we could, how the work that we can do could benefit people more directly. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with what Dr. Green has said. You know, we have to, to build this multidisciplinary approach and, and by partnering, you know, universities, NGOs and, and organizations like Bruno's launched it. I think this is really the key that we need to join forces and, and cross the data. And I really like this spatial way of approaching. So I hope we, we have a lot of data. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we do have 1.5 million patients a, a, a year. So this is stuff that we could probably do. I mean, the question that Trish asks is, is large. You know, the climate conversation, there's, there's again, there's the mitigation, you know, reducing our impact. What Bruno just said, I think we need to do that. And so that's about that internal advocacy. And the second aspect is, you know, how does it impact most of the population? I think there's several points to that. You know, you, you need to share information, like Bruno said, you know, as we're interacting with the community, you know, we could say, you know, this maybe has a link to climate change. And that would be a challenge for us. Like, how do we talk to people in Niger that are always, we we're talking with this with Jean-Paul earlier, you know, how do you tell somebody that's fleeing conflict from Lake Chad, uh, from Boko Haram, Nigeria forces, fighting and that's fighting for his life to say, oh, what about climate change? He's like, well, let me eat first and then I'll get back to you 
on this, but at the same time, if this is, as I said in the first picture, the big wave that's coming, you know, how do we how do we do what people call disaster risk reduction, but on a on a, on a very large scale, and in places where lots of times people don't really invest that much, either time or, or resource in that. So how do, how can humanitarian people help? That is 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 really what will have I think most impact. You know, how do we what if we expect you know hundreds of millions of people to move? You know, how do we how do we prepare for that in a way that reduces health risks and and mortality is is some challenges. So we need predictive models that say, okay, this is what might happen. And then we need to, to, to start, you know, anticipating the volume of needs, which is what we do. You know, we say, okay, is this, are we talking 10 million, 50 million, or hundred million? And then based on that, we need to find the means and the resources and develop operation that's going to, you know, work on that. So, and this can be on, on multitude of issues. So I think this is why it's a major issue uh, for, for, for our sector. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think um, I, I uh, see Sheila's comment here um, and reminding me to, uh, to mention that it's not just our medical students that are doing amazing things, but our nursing students, pharmacy students, dentistry students, uh, and many others are, are really uh, taking action here. So this was fantastic. Thank you all for such uh, very insightful perspectives and also for the really amazing work you're all doing so um it's uh making a big difference so thank you and i'm just going to turn it to bruno to close us off here thank you so <clears throat> I, th I think it, i think it's been a you know a really interesting uh, great panel and and um i think we cannot emphasize enough how much it's important you know to link uh, research to operations on, on this issue because i think aid organizations health organizations are very very well placed on on human impacts but at least for aid organizations they don't necessarily always have the you know analytical frames or the or the research uh, capacity to to fully make the links between what they observe and the bigger picture uh, on climate so i think that's I mean, that's really, uh, you know, a strategic uh, investment that needs to be made. And, and I think, you know, organizations like Alima and others, you know, need to be uh, really supported uh, in this uh, in this drive. And, and then on, on the mitigation, I, I, you know, I'd say it's, um, uh, you know, my message would be to 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 really insist that um you know we're already as you know in a in an emergency situation i mean some you know some warnings by science are extremely clear and um it's actually the generation of people who hold power today that now have to act and you know take you know take on political targets quantifiable approaches on how to reduce that footprint and there's you know there's no way around it it's about it's about measuring it's about setting milestones and it's about making it happen and not making it happen in, in 30 years it's about making it happen in you know now three years five years uh, ten years and and I think you know yeah I think I, I think it's important to join forces in doing this and to have as many uh, you know organizations and, and and people trying to to make this happen together so <laughs> it's uh, i'd like to finish with this call to action thank you everyone so much for joining us and thank you again to our uh, very esteemed panelists for your time and great contributions thank you